Well, hello everyone and welcome to the Integrate Professional Development webinar series. The Integrate project aims to promote faculty teaching about the earth in the context of society. Integrate is an NSF funded STEM talent expansion project. Its two overarching goals are first, to develop materials and curricula that are adoptable and adaptable for faculty to increase earth literacy for our all undergraduates. And second, to increase majors in the geosciences and related fields to develop a workforce capable of tackling environmental and resource challenges. This webinar is part of a series supporting teaching with Integrate principles using the piloted and peer reviewed Integrate developed and curated materials as tools. Uh, on the screen and in the chat box, there is a link to the webinar event page where you can find the presentation slides, resources related to the presentation, and afterwards, a recording of the webinar. If you have questions along the way, you can type them into the chat box. To access that, find the Zoom control bar and click on chat. We ask that you leave your audio muted and video off as this will allow us to get a good recording of the webinar. I'm happy to introduce today's speakers, Katya Kraft, Catherine Riyamaki, and Stephanie Sitt, who will be presenting on the current research on active learning and share examples of active learning techniques and strategies that can work for a variety of courses. They will also discuss methods for implementing active learning and how these method methods foster success for all students. And with that quick introduction, I will turn it over to Stephanie. Stephanie, I think you're still muted. Oh, hello. Can everyone hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to start with a, a quick poll. And I wanted to learn more about um, who are, who's in our audience today. And so um, the poll is just in what types of courses do you want to implement uh, active learning? Um, are you teaching large introductory courses, um, non-major courses, upper level courses, online courses, or something else? So we'll take about, you know, um, 10 more seconds to, to put in your vote. <laughs> I can see uh, maybe 10 of you are still waiting to respond. Um, but we'll go ahead and end the poll and, um, and um, I'll just go ahead and uh, share the results a little bit. Um, so it looks like a lot of people are teaching introductory non-major courses. Um, and then some other people are focused on uh, larger introductory courses, but also upper level courses, and then a fair representation from also online courses. Um, so I think um, a really diverse group here. So I think we can um, hopefully come up um, and share some active learning um, strategies that can be useful in, in all of these situations. And I think uh, we're a good resource um, for resources for each other. Um, based on um, some of our um, learning institutions or learning environments. The next question I wanted to um, ask about is just uh, to learn more about your motivation for attending this webinar. Um, so is it uh, learning about research on active learning? Do you want to develop strategies um, for your classes? Um, or better engage your students, or just learn about new active learning strategies. And in the, I realize maybe um, if you move the poll box, you can see uh, the full answers. So the second one is develop strategies for making your classes more inclusive. Um, I'll give people maybe five more seconds to answer. Um, 
Okay, we can go ahead and end the poll. Um, and so we can um, look at the um, variety of answers. Um, a lot of people are hoping to better engage their students. Um, uh, secondly, people are hoping to just learn about the strategies that are out there and available. Um, and then a good representation of people wanting to um, learn how active learning can make their classrooms more inclusive. Um, and then what is the uh, basis for uh, active learning? What's the, what is the current research on it? So this, um, the, so I was going to also ask this other question, what are your current frustrations with teaching? But uh, we don't want to be here all day. Um, so I listed some of my own. And today was my last day of teaching, so um, it has been a long semester for me. Um, but some of the reasons that I thought about were um, I don't always hear all student voices, um, especially students can be hesitant to express themselves, and I still go through this myself in large groups. Um, there are lots of, can be lots of distractions um, in the classroom. I often don't know if I'm making sense or um, if what I'm presenting is understandable. Uh, additionally, I want students to get to know one another and be resources for each other. And then finally, the, uh, another additional reason I was thinking about is I get tired of presenting all the time. So um, it's another motivation for me to, to try and incorporate active learning. Um, so what is active learning? And so I just took this uh, quick uh, quote from um, Arthur Chickering's paper and um, Zelda Gamson's paper um, called Seven Principles for Good Practice in Undergraduate Education. And they stated, uh, learning is not a spectator sport. Students do not learn much by ju just by sitting in class, listening to teachers, memorizing prepackaged assignments, and spitting out answers. They must talk about what they are learning, write about it, relate it to past experiences, apply it to their daily lives. Um, they must make what they learn part of themselves. And so I really liked that incorporation of um, involvement of the, of the learner within the learning process. Another um, definition that I um, saw from uh, some people in our geoscience community um, was putting together a working definition for active learning and included um, student participant uh, participates in activities either by doing something or observing. Um, they are provided opportunities for reflection. Um, they're often, their learning is often supported and facilitated by student and instructor interaction and assessment. And they also have peer-to-peer -peer interaction um, as uh, activities are completed. So I just thought these were two good places to start um, to think about what active learning um, encompasses and what it could be. My other um, sort of motivations for active learning are the opportunities to um, for higher or deeper order thinking. Um, so on the left here, I have um, Bloom's tech, Knowledge Taxonomy. We might be familiar with some of these um, sort of academic skills or um, of remembering, understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, and creating. And um, a lot of times active learning can um, get us, help us, um, provide more time to apply our knowledge, analyze our understanding, and evaluate material. Um, and uh, additionally, uh, create uh, knowledge as well. Um, another uh, motivation for me for uh, active learning is to create um, student-centered learning. And so this is you know, putting more focus on students um, creating real world relevance, um, um, uh, creating positive relationships between um, myself and students and uh, peer to peer, um, and also sort of um, help students uh, own, um, 
own their own education. So that's just a little bit about how we can use active learning to, um, to deepen our students' thinking skills and change our classrooms to be more st student-centered instead of instructor-centered. I wanted to uh, highlight um, a recent uh, paper done by David McConnell and uh, his uh, group um, that was published in the Journal of Science Education this past summer. It's called Instructional Utility and Learning Efficacy of Common Active Learning Strategies. So in this little table on the left, we just have uh, different types of active learning strategies like think, pair, share, lecture tutorials, or jigsaws, all of which we'll talk about later. But you can, um, they sort of diagram um, each of the um, Bloom's knowledge taxonomy and what active learning can um, help us achieve. So you can see there's, you know, using a jigsaw can help us um, analyze information and, and also provide a synthesis. So why, um, why should we do active learning? Um, so um, in the next series of slides, um, I hope to provide some um, current uh, research studies about the benefits of active learning. So the first one I wanted to touch on was uh, lower failure rates. And so uh, Freeman et al. Um, in this PNAS article uh, from 2014, they did a meta-analysis of um, current uh, studies within the STEM disciplines that compared active learning and uh, lecture-based uh, courses and what they found um, was that in the uh, active uh, learning classrooms and settings, um, the uh, failure rate decreased. Um, so more students um, were passing. Um, and um, so it was overall um, within um, science, engineering, and mathematics, um, that they found these sort of consistent results that active learning was allowing more students um, to pass. An initial benefit of active learning was is uh, increased persistence in STEM. And so um, in this, uh, the authors of this work um, created a persistence framework uh, that um, centers around active learning along with early research and learning communities. Um, but they felt like active learning, especially um, in introductory courses, are a way for um, students to not only learn science, but also grow their sci identity as a scientist. And then within that framework, um, uh, we can build students' confidence and their motivation. They felt that this was especially important in the introductory courses um, where we can often um, inspire students to um, become majors or become advocates um, in their studies uh, of science and especially earth science. An additional uh, reason for or benefit of active learning is some of the research is starting to show, especially that active learning can help um, improve performance gains for uh, diverse um, uh, students from underrepresented groups. Uh, and so these two studies are from the biology community, uh, specifically uh, introductory biology courses. And on the left here, you have uh, the sort of reddish color sort of um, are the underrepresented minority groups and their gains um, in the active learning uh, classroom, uh, classroom. The KAI is an independent um, learning assessment tool um, where students um, from underrepresented groups saw large gains. And then they also saw large gains in overall course grades. Um, in the class. Then in the, um, in the second study here that I'm showing, um, this was again from an intro biology course, 
Um, the EOP program is an education opportunity program for disadvantaged students at the University of Washington. And here they looked at high structure courses versus low structure courses. So they considered high structure to be more active or more assignments, um, more interactions um, for the students. And so here the, um, the gains are also um, greater for the um, education opportunity program students um, that are in the high structure system. So um, these benefits of active learning um, can not only help in an individual course, it can help um, students persist in a degree program, and um, it can also, active learning has also been shown to help uh, groups that are most vulnerable um, or, uh, in the sciences and that we're hoping to attract. I'm gonna take a time uh, to pause uh, for comments, questions, and reflection. Um, so you can go ahead and uh, feel free to write anything in the chat box. Um, then you might have um, a comment or question or reflection about. We'll also use this time to uh, switch over to an, our next presenter, uh, Catherine Rimaki. Any questions? Um, I'll just uh, um, quickly sort of summarize a little bit of what I've seen. Um, so one was about labs. Um, so I think labs are definitely um, uh, an advantage for the sciences that is sort of, uh, we can have a built-in um, activity and uh, where students can um, have a hands-on opportunity to learn and interact with data and um, go through analysis and synth synthesis to um, present the information. Um, another um, thing that I noticed was just about sort of breaking up um, lecture with activities. And I think that's also like um, a great idea and suggestion. Um, you know, sometimes we can only focus for 10 to 15 minutes and then it's good to um, sort of break things up um, uh, with a class activity or short time for reflection or questions. Um, but with that, I'll, I'll hand it over to Catherine. All right. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, so for uh, the next part of this webinar, we're going to uh, go over a couple of ideas of how to engage your students. Stephanie showed a um, table of maybe 10 to 15 options. Um, for the sake of time, I'm going to talk about four. Um, but where I wanted to start was a quote that um, I have anonymous here, but it's not from me. It's from someone who I heard speak about uh, actively engaging students um, at a workshop at Temple University and he observed that if you would teach your class the exact same way whether the students are there or not you're probably doing it wrong um, and to me that's a nice reminder that um, the students are an integral part of the class and should be engaged. Um, that said let's see if I can get this to advance um, there is no single answer in how to um, do this and that's both wonderful in terms of being having the freedom to be creative and also intimidating. Um, some of the questions that you might consider um, as you're thinking about how to engage students and what particular style of active learning makes the most sense um, is things like um, how much time do you have both for planning and for the implementation. I already see in the chat box people grappling with the idea of you know how much do I content do I need to cover and will there that be lost when I try to actively engage the students. Um, how important is the concept I want the students to grapple with? For me the more important it is the 
um, more uh, time I want to spend on that concept. Um, and couple that with uh, having it be a concept that students struggle to understand. Again, that leads me to spend more time on it and want to have a more substantive, active learning um, activity. Um, there are always logistical challenges, class size, room arrangement. We have a logistical challenge today, which is we're on a webinar. Um, and so I'll talk about some of the options here um, for engaging students. In an ideal world, we would be able to try out all of these, um, and so you could see them in action. Uh, but most of these are actually designed for in-person teaching, um, not online teaching. So um, th that's one of the, the challenges that we're grappling with. Um, finally, you know, things like what is the personality of my class? How will they respond to this? Are they going to, are, are they tired of the um, active learning that we've done already? Do I need to mix it up? Are they tired of the, just listening to lecture? Um, and all of those things are important. Um, so I'm going to go through four different options um, and, uh, you know, an overview of what they look like, as well as an example of each. Um, again, there are lots and lots of options, and each one of these can be implemented in a different way. So um, I, you know, try not to get hung up on whether there is a right way or a wrong way to do any of these. Um, really, this is just food for thought. So we'll start with um, using personal response systems, but before I get there, um, let me just say that there are two links um, at the bottom of this slide uh, for more information on these four, as well as other ideas for your classes. Um, both of these links are from the CERC website, um, and so I encourage you to visit them on your own time um, to, to see what some of the options are. In addition, you know, please consider your colleagues as resources, and I love seeing the, the discussion happening in the chat right now um, where people are already sharing ideas. Um, you know, that, that's wonderful. Okay, so um, I'm going to start with personal response systems in part because that's um, <laughs> the thing that we can replicate the easiest in, in this setting. You guys have already seen this um, a little bit with the two polls that Stephanie did. Um, so basically, you pose a question to the class. Um, it can be a multiple choice question uh, that focuses on one key concept of the lesson. It can be a poll question, totally opinion based that Stephanie did. Um, but generally, if you want the students to really reflect on what they're learning and get information from them on what they're learning, um, it really is best to have it be a content question. So, you know, this happens in the midst of a lecture. You might do five to 10 minutes of lecture, and then you post a multiple choice question on the board or the screen. The students think about that question. They respond. This can be low tech. They can raise hands, for example. They can have pieces of paper that they hold up that has their answer, um, or it can be higher tech. So there can be some technology clickers. Um, I'll, I'll show an example in just a second. Depending on how they respond, if there's somewhere around 50 to 70 percent uh, of the class answering correctly or what you think is the best answer, um, you might have them discuss their answer with the neighbor and then vote again and see if the class kind of converges on a consensus. Um, if everyone gets it right, you don't need to do that step. If everyone gets it wrong, you probably need to have uh, a few more instructions and advice for them. Um, and then someone, whether it's you or students, um, talk through what the right response is or <clears throat> why you would favor one response over another. Okay, so here's an example that I've done in one of my environmental science classes in which we were talking about um, overfishing. And so the students were presented with this graph of the catch numbers through time for a fish called the orange ruffy. Um, 1977 until 2011. Um, you can see a black curve there is the global catch and then it's broken down by region. And the question that the students are asked is, you know, when was the population highest? Um, and so they might be given this multiple choice options of particular years. So you can do that again by hand raising, um, who had A, who had B, and so on. Um, I want to show you one other example besides what's um, in Zoom, and this is a technology that we use in 
um, a couple of the large classes that I teach in called Poll Everywhere. Um, and you guys can actually participate in this right now. Um, so if you want, you can go to the website pollev.com slash geo102. Um, and I've put the link into the chat box if you just want to click on it. Um, and you can go to that website and vote on you know, which year you would prefer. Um, I have it set right now so that as people vote, um, the, the results should show up. So there's the, the first one. Um, as people are, are thinking about this, I should say that, um, you know, the uh, version of Poll Everywhere that I have um, at the moment is their free version. And so that is limited to um, only 40 responses. Um, so there are more than 40 of us here today. Uh, so if you're one of the last voters, your, your vote may not register. Um, but you can get a um, paid subscription. You can also, uh, you know, just use this in smaller classes. Okay. So, um, you know, at some point you can cut this off. Um, you can change the settings so that um, the students can't see the results until um, after everyone has voted. Um, you can change the, the way the bar graph looks and, and so on. Um, what I would observe here is that, you know, about 80% of you would say 1990, and presumably that's because that's the, the peak in this curve. Um, before I tell you the answer, because you're probably interested in knowing, um, I'm going to actually switch this up and show you that depending on the technology, you might have um, other options for the types of questions. So clickers, um, what people you know think of as clickers are often just multiple choice. Um, and so you may have four or six um, multiple choice buttons. Um, for uh, Technology like Poll Everywhere, there are a couple of different question types that are available. Um, and so, see if I can get this to advance to the next slide. So, um, this is another option, which is a um, graphical uh, display. And so, again, from the same website, um, you can click on the graph where um, you think the, the peak was, the peak in population. And um, you can start to see that there are uh, markers showing up um, in roughly around 1990, uh, a couple uh, around 1977. Okay, so this is a, a nice flexible tool for um, a couple of different ways to interact with the students. Um, the actual answer, or the best answer, we don't really know, um, but we talked through 1977 being perhaps a better answer than 1990 because this is catch. And so what you're not accounting for in just the peak of the, the production curve is that there were more ships. So the effort was, was bigger in 1990 than it was in 1977. That's an important concept for us. So I do like to spend time on that particular question. Okay, so that's a, a flavor for personal response systems. Um, that has uh, sometimes fraught with it technology and, um, you know, all the issues, potential issues with technology that you might have. Um, so for the class that I'm working on this semester, which is a large introductory climate science class, um, we've gone more towards a lower tech worksheet model. Um, and so in this case, uh, you know, the instructor gives a short introductory lecture. And then we pass out worksheets for the students to do in pairs or individually. Um, they're able to talk to each other, get help from the teaching assistants and the lead instructor. Um, and then we talk through what their answer is and they, we, we do have them turn in the worksheets at the end. This helps them um, work through misconceptions and difficult concepts um, that we you know, want them to put pencil to paper um, to, to solve. So, uh, you know, here again, an example from this intro climate class, um, we wanted the students to uh, be able to connect carbon dioxide emissions to what carbon dioxide concentrations might look like as a result. Um, hoping to work through the idea that 
um, concentrations can be going up even as emission rates are stable or emission rates are going down. And so the students had a lecture on um, the human impacts on the carbon cycle. They worked on this worksheet that you can see on the right half of the screen in pairs. The instructor discussed the results and then we moved on to um, intergovernmental panel on climate change scenarios, which are much more complex. All right, third example here, um, and really one of my favorites. Um, I, I try very hard to use this um, in, in all of my classes. Uh, it's called a gallery walk. Um, in this case, you are grouping the students um, into small groups and giving each group a prompt, generally an open-ended prompt to respond to. I tend to use um, large post-it notes, but if you have chalkboard or whiteboard space around the room, you can use that as well. The idea is that the students get up and move to the place in the room where their prompt is on the wall, and they respond to that prompt. Um, then, after a couple minutes, they stop and they move they move to the next prompt. And so the class kind of rotates around, spend a few minutes at the new one, um, responding to what the previous group has said, adding your own thoughts. A few minutes pass, you move on to the third, um, the third prompt for you. And you do this until you've made it all the way around the room back to where you started. Um, and then you get to see your original comments and all of the comments from the class that has been added to your sheet. Um, and so, each group might then report out the key points of what's on their um, sheet for their station. Okay, this one obviously is hard to demonstrate in a webinar format, but here are some um, photographs from an example that Stephanie and I ran um, a couple months ago at Oregon State at a um, workshop that we did for Oregon State faculty. Um, and our goal there was to have them discuss uh, you know, as a, as a scene setter, what is the purpose of higher education and what are we trying to do? Um, really broad questions. Um, and we had about seven questions and, you know, they looked like, how will you know when your students have learned? When are your students most engaged and motivated to learn? Um, and so you can see in the bottom picture, the um, whole group at different parts of the room in their small three or four person groups. Um, and in the lower right corner, the resulting um, large post-its for their responses. Um, and you can see from the different Sharpie colors that, uh, you know, that was different groups um, and they're, they're modifying what was written before, they're adding on things, um, and it becomes a very dynamic um, discussion. I love this because they were um, responding to things like, what is the purpose of higher education and you know I can't really express to you here how lively the discussion was the laughter that was happening and all I could think was if they were sitting in their seats raising their hands to answer it would have been a very um, dead conversation all right the last one that I want to go over um, is also a really fun one and also involves small group work and some amount of moving around the room, um, which is one way to have a nice uh, break from the students passively sitting there have them physically move around. This is called a jigsaw um, it's cooperative learning in which students become experts in one aspect of a problem. And then they rearrange and teach each other their particular aspect to complete a broader task. So in the small groups, um, you might divide up the problem by data set or maybe by different research papers on the topic. But the individual small groups, each group gets one data set or one paper to discuss and they talk about it. They become expert in that. Then the groups recombine so that there is one expert in each data set or each paper, or each topic in each new group. So they then work together, each person representing their component of the problem to complete the broader task. One great example of this, um, and actually it's available on the CERC website um, as a uh, written out assignment, is to do this for um, students understanding plate tectonics and mapping out where plate boundaries go. So the original teams might be broken up in which 
one table gets a map of where volcanoes are on the earth, another team gets a map of seafloor age, another gets the location and depth of earthquakes, and a fourth gets a map of topography and bathymetry. They work through where they would draw the plate boundaries based on their one data set, and then they rearrange so that there's an expert on volcanoes, an expert on, on seafloor age, an expert on earthquakes, and an expert on topography in each group. And so they, they work through mapping the plate boundaries um, as, as a team. All right, that was a whirlwind. Um, you know, a few important factors that I wanna leave with before I turn it over to Katya to think um, about how to make sure that you are supporting all students in the way that this is implemented. Um, for, for very pragmatic things though, implementation, you know, you think you should think through what instructions you're giving the students. Can you be terse and direct so they're not lost in the complications of, wait, what am I doing now? Um, are there any outside of class components that you need to assign ahead of time or assign afterwards? And how are you gonna hold them accountable for doing that? Will it be successful if they didn't do the outside of class component, particularly if it's something that they were supposed to do ahead of time? Um, how will you ensure that everyone is engaged? If you give a worksheet, what will happen to the students who do the worksheet really quickly? You know, are they gonna have things that they can do to stay engaged while other people are still working? Um, how will you ensure everyone's voices are heard? Um, how will you ensure, how will the students use the results? Ideally, you would do this so that the students can reflect on their learning um, and apply what they've learned to something else. Um, and importantly, how will you use the results? Again, coming back to the quote I started with, um, if you would teach the same way, whether the students are there or not, um, maybe you should think deeper about why you're having the students do this active learning. Can you use those results to really improve, help, help them learn more? Okay, and so, um, you know, the last thing that I wanna say is, you know, don't be afraid. <laughs> be creative, try out different ideas. Um, learn from each attempt that you make. This is really an intellectual exercise that can be quite complex, but it can also be really fun. And one thing that I um, really stress for the faculty I work with is, you know, practice ahead of time. Don't make the first time you do this in front of 200 students. Um, you can try out ideas on small friendly classes um, that will be accommodating for things that don't go perfectly or with colleagues, teaching assistants, um, you know, try something out and see, uh, you know, what works and what doesn't work. Okay, so with that, um, we're going to transition, but I, uh, for, for questions for me, I have up here a, um, another poll everywhere uh, question. Um, so do you have any questions? For me, um, this is yet a third type of uh, question that you can ask the students using Poll Everywhere. It's open-ended. Um, and so if anyone wants to try this out, again, you can go to pollev.com slash geo102. Um, and you can type in a text question um, and it will pop up on the screen as a um, text bubble. Um, and uh, with that, I uh, will turn things over to Katya. Um, keep the, the questions coming if you have any. Um, and if any of my co-leaders have read um, questions in the chat that should be addressed as we do the transition, um, please let me know. Okay. Um, and so I, I did see uh, one question there, which was what happens in a jigsaw if the expert group uh, gets it wrong? Um, and uh, that's a great question. Uh, I would treat it as a learning opportunity for them. Um, there, in, in a jigsaw, uh, you know, the, I guess you're the expert on, let's say, volcanoes, um, if that's what you mean. So what happens if the volcanoes group gets it wrong? Um, as an instructor, you should be circulating around to make sure that they're on the right track before you rearrange them. Because if they're leading their classmates the wrong way, <laughs> the, the rearrangement is going to have problems. 
Great question. And I, uh, so thank you, Catherine. I think um, we're, you know, keep the questions coming to Catherine because we will certainly have an opportunity for questions for all of us at the end of this as well. Um, uh, so what I want to talk about a little bit is how do we assure successful participation for all our students? And I apologize, I'm getting over a cold, so I sound a little bit like Peppermint Patty from Charlie Brown. Um, but uh, I think, so when we talk about successful participation for all of our students, I think active learning is a great starting point, but it may not be enough to support all of our students to be successful. And I think some of the questions that have been coming up have been capturing some of that because, um, you know, when, when you create an environment that fosters an openness and engagement, it starts to become a space where students feel more comfortable to be able to explore not just one right answer, which is how so much of students have sort of learned what science is in the past. And so I think it's sort of active learning as a way to really help undo some of the, the sort of way that science tends to be taught in this sort of right or wrong answer rather than an exploration of concepts and ideas. Um, and so what I want to do is just briefly talk about some different strategies that can help to enhance that experience for the students when they're actively engaged and it's more uh, student-centered. So the first one I want to talk briefly about is, if I can figure out, yeah, apparently advancing is a challenge. Um, leveraging prior experiences. So the idea is that, you know, all of our students are individuals. They come to our classroom with a variety of experiences. And if we tap into what those are, we can really empower them to take ownership of their own learning. It also helps us prevent assumptions about who our students are and what they, what expectations we have for them for when they come into the classroom. So um, rather than everybody, you know, assuming that everybody knows what a glacier is and knows what snow is, we might want to ask our students if they, you know, what their experiences have been in different climates. Um, thinking about when we talk about office hours students who are first generation students may not actually know what an office hour is and in the past going to the office has meant that they're in trouble for something so when we talk about having students come to our office hours if we're not explicit about what that means or asking our students to know help them understand what it means that's something that can be really powerful um the um you know I, i've had students who uh who was a, uh, I had a student who was an AmeriCorps volunteer who worked on the Oso landslide. And so when we talked about landslides in my class, she had, had some tremendous expertise that she could bring to that, that context. Um, I had a student who's a former military who worked on a tsunami cleanup after the Indonesian earthquake. So those kinds of experience can also help leverage the expertise that our students bring into the classroom that they may not even necessarily recognize that they have. And so what that, the, the point of that is that it helps us remove thinking about our students as deficit, as thinking what's wrong with them coming into the classroom, and we can think of them as assets, and what is the, the value that they're bringing into the classroom. Another uh, strategy is thinking about how do you make your teaching transparent. So if you're engaging in active learning, Stephanie just talked about all the sort of research behind why that's really powerful. And that's something that you can let your students know. Ultimately, you want to let your students know that you are doing this because it's gonna help them be more successful as students. Um, and that there's, there's some research behind by making your teaching more transparent, it can lower equity gaps, it can increase student academic confidence, their sense of belonging to both their classroom as well as their institution, which helps them persist. And it can increase mastery of skills that are valued by employers that aren't necessarily specific around a topic, but communication skills, um, writing, uh, the ability to think and reflect on their learning. So uh, by making your teaching transparent, you can actually address some of those skills that are going to allow them to be successful in all of their classes. So a large number of the people here today are talking about having introductory students. This is something that can be valuable for them. So when you make it more transparent that this is why you're doing it, it helps them to recognize that it's going to help them not just in this class, but in future classes as well. Um, there's a whole program called uh, Transparency in Learning and Teaching, um, and there's a template that goes with it. It's uh, called, you know, our acronym is TILT, because of course we love our acronyms, that basically says if you basically spell out what the purpose, the task, and the criteria are for a given assignment or an activity, it increases all of these different variables. 
it lowers equity gaps, inc increases student success. Um, it's a really powerful program, and it's one that really doesn't require a lot of changes to your teaching. It just allows students to understand why you're doing particular things. Another strategy that you can employ is thinking about uh, classroom norms. So if you establish what your expectations are, and it's not just coming from you, it's coming from fellow classmates. Um, this is something that can be uh, an online, you know, for those of you that are teaching online, you can have classroom norms established um, for online discussions. You can do it for your classroom discussions for specific class activities. It diminishes your role as feeling like you have to police your students' behavior. Um, and it's something that should be revisited. So you don't just assume that once you've done it, that students are going to remember it. Um, I've done it as an online discussion at the very beginning of my term so that it allows students to be able to kind of establish what's going to be the classroom norms for our, our quarter. But then I revisit it throughout the quarter whenever I have issues within a particular class activity or if I also, you know, sort of midway through the quarter, I kind of check back in with my students and see how they're doing. Um, and so the idea is that this allows students to know both what's expected of them in the classroom, and it also allows them to have a voice in the process. And an example here with gracious spaces is uh, an example of a particularly powerful classroom example where classroom norms were established in a very diverse setting and how that really helped to foster a really positive learning environment for everyone. Another is sort of within that same vein is establishing group norms. Um, and so you can actually assign that, which helps prevent falling into tra traditional roles. So like women as scribes, people of color traditionally um, tend to have their voice less heard in group activities. So when you actually assign randomly who is in a different role within a group, so like in a jigsaw activity, you can have uh, access to different groups can have different roles and it also helps them know exactly what they should be doing when they're in that group as well um, so that then not only are they working on the topic but they're also working on understanding how to to roll within the um how to behave within the group as well and what's expected of them and how they can engage actively in that process um, in addition, building connections. So one of the positive and amazing things about creating these student-centered learning environments is that students actually, I know it might be a surprise, but some of our students come to our class more than just academic goals, but they also have social goals. And when we engage in them actively, they have an opportunity to engage with each other socially. Um, and that can be really powerful for students and motivating for them to come to class. And um, when they start to build connections between and among each other, as well as with you as the instructor, they're more likely to retain and to persist within their classroom. And active learning can build that community. There's a, a larger program called Four Connections that is um, basically a strategy to build those connections throughout the term in not just active learning, but also as you as the instructor by learning their names, by using their names, having them learn each other's names, um, checking in with them, also meeting with them, and also structuring and scaffolding your activities. So I know uh, there was a question earlier about unstructured act active learning versus structured active learning. And I think part of the idea is you wanna scaffold that process so that you can essentially slowly build to them becoming more comfortable with more unstructured activities. But you can't just start at the beginning of the class that way, you really wanna kind of scaffold to get there. Um, in another, you know, this is an integrate, and so I think it's important to point out that a lot of the resources in terms of how to actively engage your students in learning in authentic content to make it more meaningful for the students, make it more relevant for them, um, and also for particularly for our systemically non-dominant populations, something like social justice can be a really powerful way to help them gain their own identity as a scientist because they can see how it relates to their own lives and their own values. Um, and so Integrate has a whole series of uh, activities that are already have gone through a peer review process and um, have active learning already engaged within it. Um, this particular one is specifically around social justice and water. Um, and uh, so, but there's uh, other ways that you could also make the content meaningful and authentic through undergraduate research or service learning. Other, and there's examples of those within Integrate as well. 
Um, so I think that I want to make sure we leave time for questions. So just sort of the key takeaways here that we've been talking about through all this presentation is that active learning increases student success, persistence, and learning for all of our students. So it's there's some powerful reasons to do it within our classroom. Active learning can fit many different contexts from very low effort, right? So some of the things like having your students raise their hand during class to kind of just quickly gauge where your students are at to things that might require more effort but can really engage your class in these deeper ways like things like the jigsaws and and the gallery walk um, and active learning doesn't necessarily guarantee that all the students engage equally so you need to be a little bit intentional about how you think about structuring it within your classroom through some of the strategies we just talked about so with that i'm gonna uh, open it up to questions for across stephanie catherine and me um, I think I saw a number of people kind of chatting, but um, yes, I want to sort of leave the opportunity open for questions. Um, so this is Catherine. I will throw out a question that um, there was quite a bit of discussion on the chat around, which is, you know, what do you do when the students are wrong? Um, and that was sort of the gist of the question about that I got about jigsaws. You know, what if the uh, content experts don't get their content right. Um, and so uh, I think Katya and Stephanie, I don't know if you guys want to weigh in. Um, I will uh, just weigh in uh, briefly to respond to this, and I did in the chat as well, to say that, um, you know, one of the lovely things about active learning is that it can model the scientific endeavor much more than just memorizing lecture material. Um, so, you know, part of what I try to accomplish in any active learning that I do is to engage the students in deep thinking. And sometimes that deep thinking is wrong, but trying to make sure that the students are, you know, really answering why they think what they think and, you know, then working through why I might have a different answer. Um, and to be transparent with them that, you know, sometimes we don't know what the answer is. And for almost everything, even if we do know what the best answer is, there was a point in time when the research community didn't. And so how did they work through um, coming up with, let's say, the theory of plate tectonics? Um, and so, you know, they shouldn't feel bad if they don't know the answer at the end. Um, it is also totally fine to give them questions that don't have one definitive answer, both in multiple choice contexts, the personal response systems pull everywhere, um, but also in the gallery walk or in the jigsaw. Um, you know, part of the benefit of doing this is the conversation that happens afterwards or during the activity. There's another question here about, are there strategies that work best for different size classrooms? And I, I think that some certainly lend themselves more to smaller size classrooms, but I also think that there are ways to be creative about how to modify for larger classes. Um, so the gallery walk doesn't necessarily mean everybody has to get up and move around, which can also, you know, certain classrooms are just don't lend themselves to that as well. You can have pieces of paper that get passed around to different groups. Um, so that then it sort of circles around and sort of pods within your classroom or jigsaw could be the same way where you have sort of um, pods of groups of, of sort of activities that then sort of the, the activities get sort of rearranged in a slightly less full classroom rearrangement. So there are certainly ways that you can be creative and modify it for large classrooms. Yeah, I wanted to comment um, something as well that I've been uh, experimenting with is um, uh, the Google Share Drive or any cloud-based system and um, sort of uh, making group uh, somewhat virtual groups um, uh, and sort of assigning um, um, tasks or documents um, in, a, in a Google Share Drive folder. Um, that students work on during class. Um, there, there's a logistical question here in the chat. Um, will the chat comments be available as part of the recorded session? Um, and Mitchell, could you perhaps respond to that? Because I don't know the answer. They won't show up in the recording, but I can download a 
essentially a text file of the of the chat and add that to the webinar event page. I think that would be great because there are um, resources that have been shared there in discussion. So. Yeah, once the recording and also that chat file are available, I'll send an email out to everyone who participated to let, to let you all know that, that that's there. Um, there's a recent question about um, uh, other technologies, and um, so um, Christine is asking about Packback, um, and I, I believe I've heard that one. Um, I think there's also um, Top Hat and um, other other options, and so some of them are either in classroom um, options for participation. Um, similar to the poll everywhere. Um, and then I know some are sort of more discussion based for like uh, thinking after class. Um, that's what I believe Packback is um, to help um, provide discussion um, after class. Uh, but um, I don't know, I always experiment first with what I've been sort of given free. I do listen to the reps, um, but sometimes I try to experiment with what is free um, first, just so I don't um, have another um, cost uh, burden for my students. Um, so, so maybe we have time for one last question. Um, so Sean asks about assessment strategies, um, not for, not only for students, um, but how can we create program level assessment strategies for active learning components um, that is for general education programs, student learning outcomes, or what about majors program learning outcomes? Um, you know, I think this is uh, sort of dependent on the program context. Um, certainly some people, some larger programs have done things like one section of a class will be traditional lecture and another section will focus on um, active learning strategies uh, or maybe one component of your course will focus on active learning strategies. Um, most people are not in that setting where you have that luxury to do. Um, so. I think a lot of uh, programs focus really on the um, content that students have learned and the skills that students have been exposed to by the time they finish a class or they finish the, um, the degree program. So, you know, one thing that you might consider in the assessment is, are there concepts that they really struggle with? Um, can you target those with active learning ideas in one or more classes and did that make a difference in the end? Um, that's sort of how people carry through that type of experiment. Um, the assessment can be anything from how are they actually doing on these multiple choice learning response system questions um, to, you know, how do they do on exams or theses or, or that kind of thing, um, but something that is being delivered. Great question. All right, since we're just about out of time, uh, I want to say thank you to Stephanie, Katya, and Catherine uh, for today's webinar. And also a thank you to everyone who attended today. I've got a couple things I want to mention briefly. Uh, one, if you've enjoyed this webinar and want to continue the conversation, perhaps in person with other earth and environmental scientists, we have a workshop coming up in April on diversity, equity, and inclusion in the earth and environmental sciences. Um, this will be at the University of Illinois at Chicago, Stephanie's institution. We'd invite everyone to apply uh, to join us at the workshop, uh, and I'll add a link to that in the chat box. And a few other opportunities. Uh, keep an eye out for webinars in January and February. 
We'd also encourage you to consider your department or course for NEGT's Traveling Workshops program. Uh, and think about joining us at the 2019 Earth Educators Rendezvous, which will be in Nashville, Tennessee this year. We have a community discussion thread where you can continue the discussion from today. I've posted a link to that in the chat. And as always, we appreciate your feedback and ideas. So if you have a few extra minutes today, uh, we'd love it if you could complete the webinar evaluation that's linked on the screen and also in the chat. Uh, we very much appreciate your feedback. So thank you all again for attending. Thank you to our presenters and hopefully we'll see you at the next Integrate webinar.